Welcome to Central Baptist Church of Livingston, Texas. We're glad that you've chosen to study God's Word with us today. We'd invite you to visit our website, centrallivingston.com, to learn more about our mission to preach, to teach, and to live the gospel for the glory of God. Now, open your Bible or your Bible app and study God's Word with us. God, as we come to you just once again this morning, thank you for the time that we've had to worship you. We remember during this season the birth of your son. We remember the joy that you have extended to us as a result of knowing him personally. Also the peace that you brought, Jesus, into the world. You brought peace between us and the Father. And we thank you for that. We were alienated from you, God. We were cut off from you, God. We could have no access to you. But Lord, we praise you because this morning you have stepped into our life and you have changed us by the blood and the body of Jesus. So thank you for coming, Lord Jesus. God, we do thank you this morning that we can pray for those around the world. We celebrate the work that you're doing around the world. God, what a reminder, a visual reminder and audible reminder that God, what you're doing extends far beyond this worship center, far beyond Livingston, Texas, far beyond Central Baptist Church. God, you are at work in amazing and in powerful ways. And we praise you for that, God. And Lord, we pray this morning for those who are serving overseas, our missionary force of over 4,000. We're praying, God, for you to use them, for you to encourage them, for you to come alongside them, for you to, Lord, remove the obstacles from their path, for you to help them, Lord, to find joy in you, fulfillment in what they're doing. But God, we pray that, Lord, as they labor and as they sow and sow and sow, that they would reap the seeds that they're sowing, just as we see above our heads. Lord, families and marriages changed, individuals changed by the gospel of Jesus. God, we pray for these believers that are above my head, and we pray, Father, that your hand would be upon them. It is not easy to leave a faith that you were born in and that's all you've ever known. But God, we know that you'll come alongside them and you'll encourage them and you'll strengthen them and you'll grow them as disciples. And Lord, someday soon, if that hasn't happened already, you will use them to win more people to Jesus Christ and make disciples of others. And Lord, that's how the kingdom grows. That's how your kingdom grows. God, we give you praise for that, and we pray for them this morning. God, would you bless our time of prayer, bless the words that we have prayed over the last seven days, bless our financial giving, multiply it, and use it to put more missionaries on the field, to reach more people for Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning once again. A couple of things I want to say is, first of all, doesn't this worship center look beautiful? Church looks beautiful. And I want to thank those who had a hand in that and participated in that. And uh, we, uh, uh, it, it, it was a three-day operation here at the church. There were individuals that um, had, uh, had been work, working to put this all together, and we're thankful for that. And for those who provided the resources to make this happen, we're thankful for you. And um, just grateful for those decorations in the lobby and here in the worship center. The place looks beautiful. And I know that I've spoken to many of you this morning, and you would have agreed as well. So we're thankful for that. And uh, also, I just want to thank those of you who came out yesterday morning. Uh, there were lots of ministries that were taking place uh, throughout the day uh, here locally in our community. Um, there was also one uh, group of ladies that went out yesterday morning to do a little door-to-door evangelism in the community. They went to about, I think, 31 doors. I'm proud of you for going out. I think some of our deacons showed up and helped them, and I'm so proud of you men for showing up and being a part of that. And what encouraging uh, conversations were had right around our, our uh, facilities here at People's Doors praying with people, sharing the gospel with people, handing people tracts. I'm proud of you. I really am. And uh, so there were a lot of great things happening in the life of our church yesterday, both in the morning, throughout the afternoon and evening. And uh, so it was so, so good to see the church 
working and in action. I want to encourage you to take a Bible this morning. If you haven't already, turn to Acts chapter 5. We're going to be there, and you see the text there above my head, and it's also in your bulletin today. We're going to be looking this morning, beginning in Acts chapter 5, verse 12. Acts chapter 5, verse 12, and we're going to walk through this story to the end of chapter 5. Every parent wants to build certain things into their kids. Am I right? If you're a parent, if you're a mom or a dad, you have wanted to build certain things into your kids. And one of those things that you want to build into your kids is obedience. Am I right? You want them to obey you. You want them to obey your voice, not because they have to, but because they eventually want to. Am I right? That's the sweet spot of obedience when it comes to parenting. You want them to obey because they want to please you. And we see that uh, time and time again. I know that's the way it is in our home. Um, But here's the thing. You want to build into your kids obedience that just simply isn't questioned. Obedience that's not questioned. So why do I got to do that? Why do I have to do this? Why do I have to go this place? Why do I have to, you know, and you fill in the blank. We want to build into that, into our kids, that sense of obeying without questioning, without giving pushback and all of that. Why? Why do we want to push that or why do we want to build that into our kids? Well, we want to build that into our kids for for the sake of safety. We want them to be safe. We know that their safety and their life literally depends upon it. In multiple settings, in small settings under your household, their life might not depend upon it, but one day their life is going to depend upon it. Simply obeying without questioning, without hesitation, without just kind of questioning authority constantly, right? God wants to instill that same kind of obedience into our lives, church. He wants to instill that kind of obedience without questioning him, without pushing back against his authority into our lives. Here's what I've come to to realize in the Christian life. Sometimes that kind of obedience brings us to places of danger, danger, rather than safety. It just does. Sometimes that obedience, that call that God sometimes gives to us in our lives is the call to do things that may not be necessarily safe, but they are, uh, or or rather, they, they may be dangerous at times, and they may not be safe. But here's the thing. We see this time and time again. In the Bible, we see this. On the mission field, we certainly see this. And in our daily life, sometimes we see this. I'll give you an example of this when it comes to missions. You know, right now, we're in a season of giving towards our global missions offering, or sometimes it's called the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Probably the majority of our church this morning doesn't even know who Lottie Moon is. Am I right? Most people don't know who Lottie Moon is. Let me tell you about real quick about who Lottie Moon was. She was the first female missionary that we sent out Submission board. Over a hundred years ago, Lottie Moon was a short stature of a woman, and she went to China. And she went to China to share the gospel. And she went there in her early 30s. She was single, and she went overseas to plant her life in a culture and in a particular setting that she wasn't familiar with, that she wasn't, she didn't grow up in. But God used her in amazing ways. But in the midst of God using her, she experienced sufferings and hardship. There's one particular story in Lottie Moon's history that, 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 that tells of, of her suffering. And as suffering was increasing where she was sharing Christ, persecution was becoming a greater problem among the people group, among the town, the city that she was ministering in. And people had come to faith in Christ. A church had been planted. And when new convert, converted Christians, they stopped worshiping the ancestral tablets of the Chinese culture that they had been raised on. There was a group, a a coup, if you will, that showed up to the gathering where these Christians were gathering to worship. And when they showed up to to challenge them, they showed up to destroy the church. And the story goes that Lottie Moon actually found out about it. She, uh, She arrived there and she got in front of those who were coming to destroy the church. And she says this, quote, if you try to destroy this church, you will have to kill me first. Jesus gave himself for us as Christians, and I'm ready to die for him right now. She, inst- she incurred bombs from Japan when the Japanese were bombing China at the time of her ministry. But she says at the very end of her ministry and toward the end of her ministry, she says this, During, then through all of the hardship and difficulties, she thrived in many ways. And she says this, quote, I have never found mission work more enjoyable. I constantly thank God that he has given me work that I love 
so much. Sometimes when God tells you to obey, when God sends you out to do certain things, he's not going to take you to a place that's necessarily safe. He's going to put you sometimes in danger. We see that from time, or time and time again in our lives. Listen, whenever you follow Christ's example, whenever you choose to talk like Jesus or just simply live like Jesus, and whenever you choose to just simply embrace the, the, the things that Jesus wants you to embrace, whenever you choose to try to live out the Bible just practically in your life, you will experience opposition in your life. You will experience sense of persecution. What Luke's doing here in this story in chapter 5 is really interesting because it comes on the heels of a story of two disobedient individuals in the church. You remember a couple Sundays ago that there the church was at a crossroads. God was doing amazing things after the first wave of persecution. Peter and John, they go back and the people are all together. They're of one accord. They're praying together. They're seeking God's face together. They're pursuing what God wants together. There is a sense of unity among God's people. God is beginning to move and he is moving. But then we see the threat internally in the church with this couple named Ananias and Sapphira within the church. They're embezzling. They're stealing from God. They're offending God. And God then takes their life. He takes them out and he ends their life. And in that moment, the church is at a crossroads. Will they follow the way of man or will they be empathetic or sympathetic towards sin or will they continue to follow what God wants, God's plan, and they choose to follow God's plan? And when they do, amazing things begin to happen. On the heels of the story of hypocrisy, after the first wave of this persecution, we see them together. They've dealt with this sin. We see unity. We see power existing in the church. And before Luke shows us the next story, and, and before he goes into this next wave of persecution that we're going to see this morning, well, he shows us this, this supernatural ministry that is taking place as a result of them dealing with the sin. If you look at verse 12 with me, Notice the supernatural ministry that is taking place. It says in verse 12, Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats. Check this out. That as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. There was supernatural ministry taking place, supernatural gospel ministry that was taking place. The early church, just like Jesus, saw miraculous signs and wonders validating the claims of the apostles, validating the claims of what God had said or what Christ had said, and now what the apostles had said. And there's this growing movement that we continue to see taking place. Jerusalem is changing. The towns around Jerusalem are transforming. And here the apostles are at Solomon's portico. They're ministering. They're doing these things. And we see two reactions there in the text. One is that there are those who are the hypocrites that are afraid to join them. They're, they're, they're not even close to getting there because they're afraid of what has just happened. Ananias and Sapphira. And yet, many people believe. Many people are coming to faith in Jesus Christ. They were added there. They were added to their number which is always the case. Where the presence of God is, church, it's going to alarm some. When God is at work in the lives of people, it's going to alarm some people, and some people are just going to, quite frankly, be driven away. But then it is also going to impact so many people that it's going to draw people unto himself. We see it time and time again. There are always these reactions that take place whenever God is at work. We see here in the text that the crowds are gathering there in verse 16. That people, not just in Jerusalem, but the surrounding towns are being impacted. And Jerusalem is literally turned upside down for Jesus. But that didn't sit well with those religious leaders. I'm going to walk through the story. I'm not going to read all of the verses this morning, but I want to tell you the story. And I want to show you what God has to say to us this morning as a result of it. Ministry that was taking place, this supernatural ministry faced opposition. If you look at verse 17, notice that, it provoked a second attack. Not everybody was excited. Not everybody was impacted in a spiritual way. Verse 17 says, but the high priest rose up and all who were with him, that is, in parenthesis, the, pa the party of the Sadducees. Let me just stop right there and explain what's happening here. The Sanhedrin, which is the 
Jewish religious Supreme Court, if you want to call it that, was made up of two political parties, right? The Sadducees and the Pharisees. What are the differences? Well, the Pharisees were more of the middle class. The Sadducees were more of the upper class, the high class, if you want to call it that. The Pharisees believed in an afterlife, that that there could be a resurrection from the dead. The Sadducees didn't believe in a resurrection of the dead. They didn't believe in the afterlife. So there are differences in the two. And these are two, if you want to call them that, political parties. The Sadducees here in verse 17 rise up, and they were filled, it tells us why, why, with what? Jealousy. They arrested the apostles, put them in public prison. So here, this second uh, attack is provoked, and it's provoked because of three big things that have happened. First of all, the apostles are popular. They're more popular than the religious elite. Number two, these signs are taking place. These guys were doing really bad things like healing people. These guys were doing really major things like, you know, helping people to see and people could could walk in the name of Jesus. These big things were happening. God was moving in these kinds of ways. And man, it was a really threat, big threat to society. The societal culture was about to fall apart. There There was a third big thing, a big rock for which they were angry. The apostles were disobedient to the religious leaders, and that set them off. Remember back in chapter 3 and chapter 4 the first persecution when the first or chapter 4 when the first persecution you know wave takes place Peter and John are going and this one man gets healed in the name of Jesus Christ and what do they do they haul him in and say hey stop that they slap him on the wrist say don't do that don't talk about this don't do these kind of things and they turned him loose but they didn't listen and they continued to do the work that God told them to do that Jesus Christ had sent them out to do We see the heart of the problem in verse 17. The heart of the problem was jealousy. They arrested them. They threw them into prison. They hoped to silence them, but watch this. God intervenes. Look at the story again, verse 19. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple and at daybreak began to teach and went right back to doing what they were supposed to be doing, what God had told them to do. An angel releases them. God instructs them. They go back to preaching, but the leaders, watch this, are confused. Look at verse 21. The second half of verse 21, and when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. Now watch what happens. Now when the high priest came and those who were with him, they wake up the next morning, they get everybody together in the room and they say, okay, what are we going to do about this problem? Go get those guys. And so it says that they called together the council, all the senate of the people of Israel, sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison, so they returned and reported. We found the prison securely locked and the guards standing outside the doors, but when we opened, we found no one inside. Now watch this in verse 24. When they, now when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed, meaning they were confused about them. Wondering what this would come to. And someone said to them, hey, hey, look, the, the, the men whom you put into prison are standing in the temple and they're teaching the people. And they're like, what is going on here? The prison gates are shut. Guards are literally standing in front of the gates. How did these guys get back into the temple? How are they now back teaching and doing exactly what we told them not to do and put them in prison not to do or to not do? And it leaves them confused. It leaves them perplexed. They're standing, they're teaching, and they're teaching the people. And so this time, look at verse 26. Someone came and told them, and and they go to the, they're standing and teaching the people, but watch what happens. Watch the reaction of verse 26. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. You see, the people had embraced the apostles. The people had embraced the words of Jesus Christ and the power that God was doing among them. But the religious leaders, the religious elite had pushed back. The religious elite had had out of jealousy said no. They were trying to figure out how to eliminate this problem just as they did with Jesus himself on earth. Watch what happens. They go get them. They bring them back in verse 27. And when they brought them, they set them before the council and the high priest questioned them saying, we strictly charged you not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. You intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Say, stop teaching what you're teaching. Stop doing what you're doing. 
and they question them, but it leads to a bold response. You see, they reminded the apostles, they reminded the apostles of their authority. We said no. The apostles are then going to remind the religious leaders of God's authority. Now watch this. In verse 31, God exi- it says, uh, in verse 30 rather, verse 29, but Peter and, and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging on the tree. God exalted him in his right hand and is a leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgive of sin, forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. The apostles reminded them of God's authority. They were simply obeying the words of God rather than the words of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And in this moment, they're simply following the words of God. It's reminded, it's, it's again, he almost quotes verbatim. They almost quote verbatim what Peter says back in chapter 4 when they're being told not to speak about the name of Jesus Christ. Chapter 4, verse 19 says, But Peter and John answered them in the first wave of persecution, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we see, have seen and what we have heard. And so they begin to testify to the truth in these last few verses that led to a reaction. And notice the reaction in verse 33. That when they heard this, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were enraged and they wanted to kill them. They wanted to kill the apostles. They wanted to end it right there. But something intervenes, someone intervenes, a man by the name of Gamaliel, who was a teacher of the law, it says in verse 34, who was held in honor by all the people. Now, this is a Pharisee. This is a man who was part of the Sanhedrin, Gamaliel. And he steps in and he says, okay, here's the thing. I'm not going to give a spiritual argument. He doesn't give a spiritual argument. He gives more of a pragmatic argument. And he lays out the case for two individual men who had followings, individual followings of hundreds of people who followed these individuals. And when they were killed, all the followers scattered and everything just ended. The movements had stopped under those two men. And so he puts out these two individuals, Theodos and another man by the name of Judas in verse 37, a Galilean. And so he lays out these two pragmatic arguments and he says this, listen, in the present case, you keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this is, and this is in verse 38, if, for if this is planned or, or if this is undertaking is of man, it's going to fail. But if it's of God, verse 39, then you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. And you know what they did? They took Gamaliel's advice, and they didn't kill him. And so instead of killing them, they beat them. They beat them, and they beat them, and they beat them, and then they turned them loose and said, don't do it again. Now notice what happens, verse 40 and 41. Verse 41 says, Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. The movement only grew. The movement only grows. It grows there and it grows here. Listen to me. The devil, the devil has never given up attacking the church. He attacks it then, he attacks it now. But listen to me, church, when a church stands and preaches the truth, when a church lives out the truth, when a church embraces a life of engaging people who need Jesus Christ in their life, with the love of Christ, those attacks will come. They will come. So what are we to do? Are we to shrink away and walk away? Or are we to follow the example that God tells us to follow right here? Now, here's what I think what God is saying to you and, my, you and I this morning. No matter the cost, obey the Lord. No matter the cost, obey the Lord by teaching and preaching that Jesus is the risen Savior and Lord. You know why? Because Jesus changes everything. He changes everything. He radically changes 
an individual's life. He radically changes a community. He radically changes a church. He radically changes a school. He radically changes everything. He is the answer to life's problems. He is. He always has been, and he always will be. He is the answer to the problems in your life. He is the answer to the problems in your home and your family and the people around you. He is the problem of our schools. He is the problem of our teams. He is the problem, uh, or he is the solution to the problem within our community across the board. So when God, when God is moving, listen, opposition is going to grow. When God is on the move, we can experience that kind of opposition. But when it grows and that opposition comes, we can take some actions. And I want to show you out of the text a few actions that we can take when it comes to obeying the Lord. Keep on obeying the Lord. Number one, expect opposition. Expect opposition. But stay faithful to the Lord. That's what these men do. Verse 17, going back to the story again. They expected opposition. They had already experienced it. They had already experienced it in chapter 4. They know they're going to experience it again. But they are, 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 are expecting it. Opposition will come wherever the Lord's name is mentioned. 2 Timothy chapter 3, this is what the Apostle Paul reminds us of. In chapter 3, verse 12, he says, all, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, just simply living a godly life. All those who live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Will be persecuted. Jesus himself told us and reminded us in Matthew chapter 5. He says, listen, at the end of it all, he said, blessed are those who, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil things against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. See, the fact of the matter is, these men who are in prison in the story, they just kept staying faithful, and God wants you to stay faithful. Whenever you step out in faith and you start to do things that God wants you to do or speak in the name that God wants you to speak in, just stay faithful. It tells us in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Don't be shocked. He says, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, then you are blessed because the spirit of glory and God rests upon you. He says in verse 19, therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. By the way, that's Peter. He's one of the apostles in the story. You see, we can expect that kind of opposition, but what God wants us to do is just continue to stay faithful. Just keep remaining faithful to what God wants us to do. And the angel shows up in the story. He shows up in verse 30, uh, I'm sorry, in verse 19 and in verse 20, he says, go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when you, they heard this, they entered the temple at the daybreak and began to teach. They simply followed and were faithful to what the Lord said. Just stay obedient. Keep being obedient to God. No matter the cost, stay faithful. Here's the second thing. Obey God rather than men. Obey God rather than man. Man, men in your life. That's where the apostles are. When they are, cha when they are challenged with this decision, they have this decision before them. Are they going to follow man? Are they going to follow the Pharisees or the Sadducees? Are they going to shrink back? Are they going to not say, maybe change what they were saying, maybe water it down, maybe lighten it a bit, maybe show up at times when the Pharisees and Sadducees might not be there, Maybe they're going to change what they say to water it down to maybe not use the name Jesus, but just insinuate him. No, they continue to obey, obey God rather than men. That's the choice that's before us. Listen, we understand that the Bible tells us time and time again as a Christian, you're supposed to submit to human authority. We're all supposed to, to submit to human authority because it is God's authority in our life. We understand that we're supposed to pray for God-given authority. Listen, political parties are going to be in charge of our country multiple times, different political parties. We had the Republican Party in charge of our country for a season. Now we have the Democratic Party in charge of our country for a season. 
in every case, as a Christian, I'm called to respect the authority that God has placed over me. I'm called to pray for the authority that God has placed over me. There are going to be times when I disagree with the Republican president who's in office. There are going to be times when I disagree with a Democrat president who is in office. But I'm called to respect that office, and I'm called to pray for that office. But here's the thing. At the end of the day, if that authority begins to misuse or abuse the power to forbid what God commands, then your responsibility, regardless if it's a Republican or it's a Democrat or it's anyone, then your responsibility is to disobey that human authority because God is the one who is over all things. That's what you do. That's what I do. And so here's the thing. They were simply attacking the truth. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were simply attacking not these men, not the apostles, not the church. They were attacking the truth. And what they did not realize and what they did not understand, and this is what in culture today and in in a world today does not understand. The apostles were the judges. They were not on trial. The apostles were the judges. The religious leaders were the ones who were accused because they had offended God and they had gone away from God's truth. They lay out that truth there at the end of verse 30 and 31 and 32 when they lay out the fact that, listen, you killed him. You killed him, God raised him, and God's exalted him as Savior and Lord. And so listen, obey God rather than men. Thirdly, listen, as we stay and continue to obey God in our life, thirdly this, recognize that God sometimes works in ways that we can't expect or we don't expect. That's what happens in the story. Gamaliel, a God, God raises up this man by the name of Gamaliel who is a pragmatic a pragmatist. He's not a spiritual person necessarily, and he's more of a pragmatist in verse 35. But God intervenes in this moment so that these men are not killed. And in so doing, the movement is going to continue to grow. God works and he moves and he intervenes in ways that we sometimes don't understand or imagine. I led a mission team from a church I was serving at a few years ago to southern France. Our mission agency has a project in southern France in Marseille, which is the sister city to Paris in Marseille, large city in southern France. It's right on the south, southern coast of the Mediterranean Sea. Our mission sending agency has a project there to reach North Africans who are there coming across North Africa into Europe on major, these massive ferry ships. When I say massive ferry ships, it takes 24 hours to be on these ships. They can carry about 1,000 cars and vehicles of people. And they're constantly coming across, and they're constantly leaving Europe to go back into North Africa. So the people there are from Morocco, and they're there from Algeria, and they're there for the, the variety of different countries across Northern Africa. And so we have a project there that is funded by you and I, us, where you can go as a mission team and they have Bibles and they have resources there in Arabic. And what you do is you stand in lines right outside the ferry gates with people who line up there some 10, 12, 15 hours before their ferry leaves. And they're loaded down with items. And you stand there and you just say, a Muslim greeting to them, and you try to give them a Bible, and you try to give them gospel materials. And the prayer is that they would get into their vehicles, and they would make their way back into North Africa, where it is illegal to be openly talking about Jesus. And so thousands of Bibles are going out, and so I had a team that was there, and we were working, and we had been doing this work. It was one afternoon, and we went into the interior part of the city in a, in a more of a North African sector of Marseille. It was all Algerian people. And as we were walking, I was also handing Bibles to Muslim men who were there as we were walking in tight quarters. And so several were taking, several were laughing, dismissing, but they, a few took, took them. And this one man in particular came by, he was a younger man, probably in around 40 years old. His son was about uh, 18 or 19. His father could not speak English, but his son could. And when he came by and he took a Bible at first, and then he became kind of mad at me because I was handing him something that was Christian. 
The shop owners around the town or shop owners on the streets had been watching me, and so they became more and more agitated and more and more angry than what I was doing. To the, point, to, to the point in which I was surrounded by these Muslim men who were yelling, angry, very agitated. But in that moment, that father looked at me and through his son said, it's okay, I'm going to protect you. It's okay. And as we were standing there surrounded by men who were screaming and yelling at, at us, my eyes were fixed upon the father and the son and they were just simply telling me, it'll be okay. And he would turn around, he would say, I'm fine, I'm fine. And finally, over time, after about 10, 15, 30 minutes, they went away. You see, later, we met up again. His name was Ahmed. And Ahmed was born and raised a Muslim. And we had a conversation again, and he wanted to convert me to Islam. He did. And he tried to give me the Quran. And he wanted me to listen to the Quran. And I said, I'll listen to your Quran as long as you'll take a Bible and you'll listen to me. And we had a great conversation. The point that I'm telling you, and the reason I'm telling you is this, the reason I'm telling you this story is this, that God intervenes in your life. When you simply obey what God wants you to do, at times it doesn't make sense. At times it may seem fearful. It may seem scary. But God will intervene. God does things that are unexpected, as he did that day in my life, and he, he changed my life just to my own perspective, and he reminded me and just fortified further into my heart and into my life, God has your back. He has you. He goes before you. He's around you. He's to your left. He's to your right. He has you. And God has put you in a position of being able to and being willing to trust him. God is always at work. He's always fulfilling his purposes. Last thing I'll tell you is this. And when you're obeying the Lord, as you keep on obeying the Lord, even in the face of opposition at times, remember that the joy outweighs the suffering. The joy will always outweigh the suffering. You see the response at the end. They didn't shrink back. They didn't run away. They didn't second guess. They didn't, they didn't second guess what they were saying. Instead, they left in verse 41, rejoicing, counted worthy to suffer the dishonor for the name. And what did they do? Every day, in the temple, house to house, door to door, they didn't cease to teach and preach that the Christ is Jesus. You see, witnessing was a way of life to them, and it brought them joy. Even in the midst of their suffering, it brought them joy. A few years ago, I led another mission team to Las Vegas, Nevada. I took a group of three men with me, to Las Vegas, a man in our church at the time had never been on a mission trip before, and I just felt like the Lord was saying, ask him to go, and so he went with me. He was a layman in, my, in our church, and so he went, and he and I stayed together. We were in the room together in Vegas, and we were there, and what we did during the day is we helped do door-to-door -door evangelism in North Las Vegas for a church that had just started there, North Las Vegas Baptist Church, and so we were helping that church during the day, but at night we would go down on the strip, and we would hand out tracts to people and try to get into gospel conversations with people on the Las Vegas Strip. And so we're standing there, and this one particular man, the guy had asked to go, in which he was white when I asked him to go on a Wednesday night. I'll never forget it. And finally he said, okay, I'll go with you. And so we went. And so we're, we're, I placed him right in front of the Bellagio Hotel, the one with all the water. And for about three hours that night, people from all over the world, all over the country, are there flowing up and down those streets, and he's just passing out tracks. But here's the thing, church, when you do that, you're going to get opposed, you're going to get laughed at at times. And he did. And I'll tell you what, he had to suck up his pride because every time he would hand out a track, nine times out of ten, they would walk about ten steps, they'd look at it, and they'd just throw it over their head on the ground. And so what we had to do is go over and pick up the tracks in front of people. Swallow your pride. But he did this for three hours. But what he didn't realize is that for three hours, this security guard at the the uh, hotel across the street had been watching him for three hours. It was a female, and she had been on duty. And at the end of the three hours, he was about done, and I walked down. And when I walked down, he had this big smile on his face, and he's telling me this story. And he says, listen, this security guard had been watching, and she, she kept watching me, and I, I didn't even know she was watching me until the very end. And she walks up to me, and she says, why are you doing this? Like, I see what you're doing, and this is humiliating. Why are you doing this? And so he told her. And he shared the plan of salvation as best as he could to this woman. And the security guard 
broke down in tears at the end of it all and gave her life to Christ right there in front of the Bellagio Hotel. Now, I'll tell you that story to tell you this, that when I walked down and I met up with this man who had never shared his faith with anyone in his life, he'd never been on a mission trip ever in his life, he finds himself on the Las Vegas Strip across from the Bellagio Hotel sharing the gospel with the very first person he ever shared the gospel with. Having been humiliated for three hours, he looked at me and he said, it was worth it with a big smile on his face. And he's never been the same. He's now one of the mission's leaders, one of the leaders of his church where he serves at. He's led mission teams all over the world, North Africa, all over the place. He's still a lay leader. He's a small business owner. But God works in these ways. And what I want to say to us is this, that no matter what the cost, keep obeying the Lord. Just keep obeying him. And remember, the joy will outweigh the suffering. It always does. Outweighs the suffering. Keep obeying him by preaching and teaching that Jesus is Lord and Savior. To your team, to your class, your group of friends, to your employees. It's Christmas season in your family gatherings. To those family members you've been praying for, keep obeying Jesus. In every respect, keep obeying him. Why? Because Jesus changes everything. You bow your heads and close your eyes with me. I ask our worship team to come forward. They're going to lead us in a song in a moment. We're going to have a time where we stand and we respond. Listen, Jesus changes everything. He can change your life. He changes my life. He can change your life. If you're here this morning and you've never trusted him, he wants to change your life. He wants to transform your life. It requires you trusting him. It requires you by faith believing in him. Saying no to your sin, turning away from your sin, embracing Jesus as your Savior and Lord. He is Savior and Lord. That's why we celebrate. That's why these decorations are hung. He is Savior and Lord. He always has been and he always will be. But he wants to be the Lord and Savior of your life if you don't know him. We're going to have a time here at the front where we stand and sing a song together and you come forward if you want to give your life to Jesus Christ. If you want to know what that looks like and what that means, you come forward and you ask us. You come down from the balcony, you come down from the back, wherever you might be seated. You just ask to be excused and come on down this aisle. We'll talk to you and we'll start that process about what it means to follow Jesus with your life. Maybe God's speaking to you about baptism. You need to be baptized if you haven't been baptized in a believer way, in a believing way, after you've given your life to him. Maybe God's talking to you about joining our church or you just need a matter that you have on your heart that you need prayer for. Listen, church, we are here at the front to pray with you. We're ready to pray with you over any matter, talk to you about any matter, counsel you about any matter. But you've got to be obedient to God's call on your life. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to stand and sing. We're going to worship the Lord together. You have the courage to come this morning. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your goodness, your grace. Thank you for sending your son into the world. We thank you for the courage that you give us to keep obeying you. Help us to be found obedient now. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to one of our services. We would love to invite you, if you're ever in the Livingston area, to worship with us. We're located at 503 Northeast Avenue in Livingston, Texas. Here at Central Baptist, we are an intergenerational body of baptized believers with a blended style of praise who value expositional preaching, meaningful membership, consistent discipleship across all ages, and a gospel emphasis both locally and globally. If you'd like more information about Central, please visit our website at centrallivingston.com. Once again, thank you and have a blessed day.